3rd of December 1967 was the event of the world's first heart transplant and it happened at Krudeskir Hospital. I wasn't there, I was uh, not old enough to be part of it then, but I did join the heart transplant team in 1975 and I did work with Professor Chris Barnard in, in the team and I did do quite a few heart transplants and so I guess they thought as half the participants had already died, they might as well get hold of some of those that are still alive. And that's how I got invited. Well, I was there from 1975 to 1979. And uh, I was uh, a theater sister. So I scrubbed for the surgeons, with the surgeons, and for a period I was also in charge of the theatre that was known as C11. I was about 24 when I started there. I had just completed the operating theatre training at Kruderskir and I was invited to join the team. And I was scrubbing for surgical procedures right from then. You work there for a period during your surgical training and I guess someone sees you and thinks that you might fit in. And that's how I guess I got in. I don't recall exactly who the patient was, um, but I do recall getting woken up in the middle of the night. In those days we didn't have cell phones, you had a telephone and asked to come to Grutteskir because we had a donor and a recipient. And the next thing I knew, I was preparing to assist Professor Barnard in a heart transplant. It was exciting. Well, of course, there'd have been a recipient waiting. So that's already stressful for the family and everyone else. You're literally waiting for someone to die so that you can get their heart. And that's what happens. Someone does die. They are declared brain dead. Uh, the p family is approached and it's a very tough time for the family. It's a very difficult decision to make, but also a very beautiful gift that anyone can give. And once that has happened, that uh, the, the donor's family has agreed to donating the heart and today many other uh, organs, it's go, go, go. You know, everything's uh, put in place, it's already prepared, and uh, the patient, the recipient, is told, so they would be quite stressed. The anaesthetists are ready, the uh, lab te technicians, the pump technicians, the pathologists, the scrub nurses, the assistants, everybody is on standby because you're on call as such, and you rush out and you get there and you're, well, we're all pretty well trained. You set up your instruments and uh, when you're ready, the surgeon, the assistants, the technicians, you, your floor nurses, the anaesthetist and anaesthetist assistant, all go into theatre and start doing your job of preparing the receiver or the recipient's chest while in the other theatre, the donor is being prepared by a similar team to remove or harvest the heart, which is then brought through to the theater where the recipient is waiting under anesthetic and the procedure is carried out. And it, it takes a couple of hours and it's a very tense time. And uh, the most incredible memory I have of that is on a few occasions, the heart starts beating spontaneously. When the blood from the, uh, the um, bypass machine is warmed up to, to body temperature and it passes through the new heart and that heart starts beating spontaneously, it, it is miraculous. always sad if you lost a patient and we didn't only do heart transplants, we did cardiothoracic surgery. There were often people with uh, serious heart defects or valves that need replacing 
or coronary bypasses. But one of the saddest uh, occasions I recall was we had a woman who had a very serious heart defect, which we were operating on, and she really needed a transplant, and we were trying to keep her going for as long as possible by doing surgical procedures, and it wasn't working. And I recall very vividly the prof calling for a baboon because we had done enough research to know that a baboon and a chimpanzee heart can tide the patient over until such time as um, a donor, human donor, donor heart is uh, available. And we did the procedure. And uh, the baboon was brought into theater and treated just as a, as a human patient would be treated but it had to be really euthanized because it wasn't an ill or dying baboon. And the heart was harvested. It was transplanted into the patient. As I recall, I think it was a female. And uh, she was then taken out to ICU. And at the end of the case, when I was going home after all the cleaning, etc., I was struck by the fact that there was a baboon, cadaver, lying, waiting to be taken away, as bodies would be taken away. And it struck me that this was a very healthy adult baboon who had sacrificed its life to save a human. At the time, it was really cutting edge surgery. We're talking about the 70s. We did certainly not have the kind of uh, techniques, the kind of equipment that is available today for, for transplant surgery. And so it was really, it was, a, it was almost a necessity. The important thing to realize that uh, although animal research is a very emotive topic, animals are part of the whole of the web of life. And it's through their sacrifices that we have been able to develop the kind of things we have developed. Because today, if they harvest a heart from a donor, they can actually keep that heart perfused and alive and take it to the recipient. Because those people are incredibly ill. You can't fly them to where the donor is. And it doesn't make sense to fly a body that is brain dead so the heart can be harvested and that sort of thing is thanks to the research that was done in the animal lab on baboons to find that you could remove a heart, perfuse it and re-implant it and the baboon survived. So that's how it was discovered that you could take a heart to the patient. We did have one surgeon who was um, known for his singing voice and uh, while he was singing, you knew things were pretty okay. It got really tense during the middle part of the surgery. When he started singing again, you knew that the tension was easing off and we were coming to, towards the end of things. So yes, we did have a lot of fun. Professor Chris Barnard was very charismatic. He could be very charming. And um, he wasn't well known for knowing people's names or remembering their names or the names of instruments. And uh, Sister Pitti Rodenbach, who was my senior and in charge at that time, warned me that I had to watch very carefully what he was doing and give him what he needed and not what he asked for. Because he would often ask for the type of instrument that you wouldn't even have in a cardiac theater because his head was going so quickly. So if he asked for a particular instrument and you knew he couldn't possibly use it there, you gave him what he needed, not what he asked for. And often there were newer people who, to their folly, gave him what he asked for, not what he needed. And um, that could uh, create a little bit of um, tension, to put it mildly. Yes, I think most people who work at that level, who have that kind of imaginative skill that really, one could say, borders on the genius, I think that they battle sometimes because people don't keep up with their very rapid thinking process. And yes, 
uh, I think because his head was going so much quicker than the procedure, he was already seeing things that were five or six steps ahead of where his hands were, he would get temperamental. And um, not only that, I think some of his temperamentality was caused by the fact that he had rheumatoid arthritis. So when you're in pain and things aren't going the way you want them to, you can get a little bit titchy. There was a case that his brother Marius was um, uh, involved in and Marius was a great surgeon as well, but I don't think he had quite the imagination that his brother Chris did. And he needed help and he asked for Chris to come in and help. And because I was Chris's theatre sister, I had to join in as well. And I recall him standing with his eyes closed and thinking. He was imagining what to do. And uh, it was a, a, a young child who had uh, an atrial defect, so there was not much atrial muscle, as I recall. And he imagined and then asked for the leg to be prepared, and he took some of the leg muscle to increase the size of the chamber of the heart. And um, to the best of my knowledge, that was a pretty innovative uh, step at that time. Well, if I go back to those times, and, and just to digress, we do have it naturally, but we unlearn it. If I go back to the times of the heart transplant team, um, we did cardiothoracic surgery, not only transplants, and very often those people were extremely ill. And every now and then, everything would go wrong. And it didn't matter what you tried, everything just seemed to be going against us. However, the patient would still recover and even thank everybody for the wonderful work. And I recall on more than one occasion, Professor Barnard saying, well, there's someone else going home in spite of us. And that made me wonder what goes on that gets the body to recover, even though it would appear everybody's trying to do something to the contrary. And I realized then that he was using intuition on a different level very often. And I guess that started my journey about what is it that the imagination can conjure up that in the moment doesn't appear apparent. But if you then work with what the imagination is conjuring up, you can actually create something that might seem impossible. I think generally people are becoming so overwhelmed by technology. Technology is wonderful. If I just think back on the transplant days too, the type of equipment we used then required you to be imaginative because we didn't have the equipment that does everything for you now. We had to be imaginative. Whether you were a doctor or an anaesthetist or a nurse, you had to really tap into that part of you that took you to the next limit. We seem to have lost that. Technology is giving us a lot of advantages, but it's also taking away from us. So the people who come and learn how to use their creative mind are people from every walk of life, including doctors, psychologists, business people, sports people, scholars, stu university students, even moms. Everyone wants really to be able to use their whole mind. And I think that the price of technology is that we have almost unknowingly given up our ability to just use that imaginative mind.